There you go. Yeah, I'd like to call the Finance Committee meeting of November 14, 2023, to order at five minutes after 1 p.m. And thank everybody for being here. I think we have uh, have collected, connected properly the entire committee present, uh, but uh, we'll know in a second. Uh, but this meeting is being held by Zoom. Uh, pursuant to the current application of the open meeting law, meeting law, members of the public have access to the meeting via Zoom, um, and, but everybody um, who's in attendance uh, should be aware that this meeting is being recorded both audio and visual uh, so that uh, uh, it's important that you know that. Um, that said, I would like to go through the membership of the committee and uh, make sure that everybody can hear me and we can hear them. So um, I'll start with uh, Anna Devlin Gauth here. Yeah. Um, Lynn Grusner. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Matt Holloway. Here. Bernie Kubiak. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Of course, I am present. Uh, Alicia Walker. Alicia, we didn't hear you. Uh, your mic. Can you hear me? Yes, now we did. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. So um, all members of the community are present. So um, the agenda, as we always do, it uh, starts with call to order, which we just did, and then review agenda followed by public comment. So um, the one thing that I want to um, uh, explain and just see if there's uh, agreement of the committee to that is that uh, there was substantial discussion last night about the Jones Library building project bond authorization. And uh, it was uh, uh, then towards the end of the meeting, um, we made the decision that uh, on Friday, we would convene um, a, a council meeting of the whole so that all counselors um, who are interested in attending the meeting um, that in which we're going to be discussing the Jones Library uh, would be present. And I, and Paul, I think you were going to uh, let Sharon Sherry know the plan to um, handle other issues today and reserve um, as much time as necessary for the Jones Library discussion on Friday. Yeah, the only, I thought you might be con collecting questions today, right? That's the only possibility. So I, uh, because it is on the agenda, uh, the uh, Difficulty with collecting questions, however, is that uh, Athena was not going to have time before this afternoon's meeting to catalog the questions that came out of yesterday's meeting. And so we wanted, we don't want to duplicate the effort that was made last night. So to some extent, uh, it might be most useful for uh, a, a memorandum that can be a public document if it's possible and Athena will have to advise us so whether it is um, could go to the committee and then give the committee an opportunity to respond only to her and to me. Uh, Kathy. Uh, I, th I think you I think you just said what I was going to suggest Andy so if we if we get that list and we think something is missing, we just add to it. I mean, I sent Lynn a, Lynn a list this morning, but it would be easy for me to merge mine in. So that's what you're suggesting. Athena would get us something that tried to capture last night. The issue is that Lynn has got other questions that were sent earlier. So just getting some amalgam of something to us and then letting us add to it would save time rather than doing that in discussion today. I agree with that. I think Lynn, so. I'm trying to Lynn, look and Kathy, Lynn and Kathy, if you have a list, I can incorporate them into 
if you send them to me, I can incorporate them into one document. So we have them all together for Friday. All right. I have the list and I and I can get that to you as well as uh Kathy, have are you suggesting that all of the emails you've sent me with questions are now in that one document? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if, if if I'm missing anything, um, I, I'll do a double check. But so I don't think you have to go back through all your emails, Lynn, and catalog them. You can take what I sent today and share it with Athena. Okay, thank you. So, uh, process we just described agreeable to the committees. If, if if nobody raises their hand, I'm just going to assume that the answer is yes. So. Uh, uh, we will not be discussing and anybody who's in attendance should recognize that we're not going to discuss uh, that uh, the library today. However, um, during public comment, it has always been our policy that uh, we take public comment on any business that uh, is uh, relevant to the finance committee. It does not have to be on the agenda. It does not have to be on the agenda today. So, uh, just want to recognize that as we go on finishing the agenda discussion. Uh, so my thought was then to uh, have an opportunity to talk about the um, beginning of the budget guideline process, which really is mostly to make sure since the financial indicators presentation last night leads into the budget guideline discussion and development that uh, we have an opportunity also to ask um, any questions that um, flow from that discussion uh, in presentation last night. And uh, that would be um, what we I would propose to do. And that would allow us to then uh, get to the supplemental budget appropriation requests, which I think is a major item to try and get as much done today as possible. Um, I uh, did ask that uh, we have uh, staff and uh, council members, uh, Mandy Johanneke in particular, available if possible uh, for this uh, later part of the meeting so that we can uh, see if there's additional questions on rental registration. And I sent them a couple of questions that I'll get to when we get to that point in the agenda. Um, and the AHRA report, uh, I don't think uh, needs um, discussion other than the uh, transfer order today. And I uh, did have a chance to talk to Michelle Miller about that. Um, and so she, she, and she's fine with that. So uh, if the, is there any, uh, anybody who uh, has comments on what I suggest for the order of the agenda? Kathy. I just have one, Andy, um, and this is for the public too. Um, I thought we were going to get to a conclusion on rental and fees today. Are you saying we just raise any other additional questions? That's number one. And then my second is on guidelines. Can you just remind me when we need to have a draft to the council? So we've got a meeting this Friday, but I started to look at last year's guidelines to figure out where I wanted to write, just rewrite wording. So just so it's a question on timeline on how much you want to talk about that today. So I, are we going to do something on fees today or not? It was my main question. Um, the main question that you asked about fees is uh, that I, if we can get to a, to, to an, just to a conclusion, I think that we should. I have a couple of questions that sort of came out of my studying the matter on my own in between. And I guess that I would like to present those questions and see if there's responses to them so I we can all understand the, the complexity of the issue. But I was hoping to wait until 
did. Uh, I, I want to make it clear. I am fine postponing that because I have some suggestions on fees and a couple others. So it's it's more a, is it on today's agenda other than a couple more questions? That's all I'm asking, Andy. Uh, we don't have to make a decision today. Okay. I mean, you know, it's on the agenda for both meetings uh, today and Friday. I, I think that uh, what, what happened uh, is that when we decided to schedule the extra meeting, I put all of the issues on both agendas with the idea that it gives us ultimate total flexibility, but uh, recognizing that we weren't going to be able to get to all of them, it was that you can always not discuss something, but you can't add discussions to something after you've posted the meeting, unless it's uh, less than 48 hours that you knew about it. So that's how uh, I came to what I've been doing in planning of this. Um, as far as your question on the uh, financial guidelines um, and what the due date would be for that, um, the uh, first discussion in, in the council is anticipated presently for December 4th, uh, and we uh, would want to have virtually a complete draft before our December 1st meeting uh, so that anything that comes up after, on December 1st is really just minor tinkering with the final draft, which means that we're under some pressure to get um, significant progress made by our um, next in, in our next couple of meetings after today or after this week. Um, I guess uh, we really, uh, let me take that back. We, we just need to move quickly on it. Uh, Athena. If there was substantial um, changes, the, the council had feedback on December 4. We have a couple meetings scheduled on December 8 and December 15, if the committee needs more time to update the guidelines before the final vote on the 18th. Which is fine. Uh, in prior years, the suggestions from the council have not been that odorous, so we've needed more than one meeting in between. But it's always good to have flexibility. So with all of that said, um, can we move on to public comment? And uh, so let me get the participant list. Um, I already have five hands uh, raised under public comment. And as I just said uh, a minute ago, uh, it, it will re what was we are not going to be discussing the library today, but uh, our policy in this committee is that we receive public comment at any meeting about any issue that is relevant to the committee's work, whether it's uh, been in it's on the agenda for the day or not. So. Uh, there is no limitation on um, items as long as it's relevant to the committee. Uh, and uh, I, we try and limit to two or three minutes per comment. Um, Lynn, you have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, Athena, do you want to make me co-host because uh, so I can bring people in if we go beyond when you can? Thank you. So... Uh, We'll just take them in the order that they appear on the screen, which means to start with Renata Shepard. Hi, uh, Renata. Welcome All back. Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Renata Shepard, uh, excuse my voice, I'm a little hoarse. Um, Renata Shepard, uh, Justice Drive. Um, I sent us in writing, but I just wanted to make sure I made it to public comment. Um, I understand that there was some difficulty um, plugging in numbers on the spreadsheet for the rental registration fees at the last finance committee meeting. 
but uh, could you please try some some other options? Um, just adding an extra line, reducing the $250 field to $100 or $150 for one to two um, unit rental properties and increasing the $700 cap would already be helpful. Um, how would that affect the total? That still doesn't work. Is there a way to offer a discount to low income landlords like myself? Two hundred fifty thousand a year. That finance committee meeting upsets me for many hey, reasons, but uh, mostly because of some of the conversation towards the end that happened. Both and when um, we get to the here's what um, I heard section of the meeting, uh, we are uh, wasting uh, time. Uh, that that we're talking about it uh, later when uh, Mr. Mora is here and possibly uh, Councilor Haneke, uh, but. Um, I will return to those um, questions. Thank you. Um, so uh, I want to bring uh, Sarah Marshall in to the meeting. Hi, am I in the meeting? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I do want to speak to the library, but um, if you can tell me what time on Friday you'll be taking this up, perhaps I can come then. Do you know? Uh, I think that we anticipate, given the complexity of the issue, that we're going to be spending almost, if not totally, the meeting, almost all or totally the meeting on the issues, so we should be taking it up right at the beginning. Yes, but starting what time? I don't know what time the meeting is. One o'clock. They're, they're both posted for, for uh, oh, both okay. for one o'clock. Then I'll, I will reappear on Friday at one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tony Cunningham. Hi, Tony. Hi, thank you. Um, I sent an email to the Finance Committee listing financial information that I believe is required if you are to make a fully informed recommendation to the Town Council regarding the supplemental bond authorization for the library project. This includes details on borrowings above the 15.8 million town share that the town would have to take out, debt projections on all borrowings and which party is responsible, cash flow of the project showing debt service and receipts from fundraising in the MBLC, and the financial model showing the impact of debt service on the town's capital budget and the other major capital projects. In addition to charts that graphically illustrate the impact of borrowing for the library project on our capital budget, I would suggest that we need to see the five-year capital plan and how the debt service on borrowing for the library project fits into that plan. The Joint Capital Planning Committee already struggles with what to drop from the long list of requests each year due to a shortage of cash capital. If you approve this higher borrowing authorization and the town takes on more than $40 million in debt, what capital projects and purchases will be deferred because we have to pay the library project debt service? As you know, road and sidewalk repairs come out of that same pot of money. That is the 10.5% of the property tax levy. As do town vehicles, equipment and facility repairs. So too does regional school debt, such as for the middle school roof and the high school track and field project. Cash capital in FY25 is projected to be $6.5 million before deducting existing debt. If we are on the hook for say 5 million in debt service for the library, it will likely wipe out the capital budget for the year. In that instance, where does the money come from for peaks in debt service? Is the plan to tap reserves? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, appreciate it and as we list our questions, that will be helpful. Uh, I'm gonna bring Ken in, Ken Rosenthal. Uh, thank you, Chairman Steinberg. Uh, I'm not going to speak now uh, about why I think that the uh, decision that you're faced with is premature, but I do wanna to respond to something that President Griesemer said last night with all the respect that I do have for her. I think she was in error when she spoke and said that contractors require that bond authorizations be in place before they would bid on a project. As the town manager might attest, I've been involved in financing and construction projects for nonprofit organizations for 55 years or so. 
and and this I can tell you about the, the, the mentality of contractors as they consider whether or not to bid. They, first of all, want to know whether they have the capacity to do what the bids require. They also want to know what other options there are to build, bid on other projects and make money elsewhere. And then, of course, as uh, President Griesemer said, they do want to be assured that they're going to get paid. But to require a bond authorization from the town of Amherst, which would be supporting a project at the Jones Library, that's not important. They understand the town of Amherst will stand behind its projects, and so will the Jones Library. They know they're going to get paid, and they will not require a previous bond authorization. So with respect, President Griesemer, you and I disagree on that point. Thank you for listening to me, and I will hope to speak with you again on Friday. Okay, thank you, Ken. Uh, can you bring Jeff in, Jeff Lee? Hello, I'm Jeff Lee from District 5. I just wanted to speak to a document that is in the packet. Uh, it's about Jones Library Capital Campaign funding sources. And while that lists um, uh, revenue sources for the capital campaign, it omits the expenses, which will be deducted from what the capital campaign remits to the town for its uh, remaining $7.4 million commitment. Um, last I saw on September 30th, that amount was $278,000 or so. So I think that's important. It, essentially wipes out the two state grants that we've received. So um, just wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and Darcy. Hey, Darcy. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, the, I'm Darcy Dumont. I live in District 3, and I'm just um, commenting today on behalf of the Amherst Climate Justice Coalition. Um, we, You should have received uh, also our written comments um, on the FY25 budget guidance letter and the FY25 budget in general. Um, we're really pleased that counselors showed such high support for prioritizing climate action in the budget um, in answering our ACJA candidate survey this fall. Um, and also that there was funding for sustainability initiatives through ARPA um, and the $200,000 in this fiscal budget for um, the state, the capital project fund for climate actions. Um, our fir the first of our town climate action goals is to reach 25% emission reduction by 2025. That can only be achieved through a concerted effort on the part of the town. Um, in our budget requests, we urgently need to at least double our capacity to accomplish the climate justice goals uh, by hiring additional full-time professional level staff members. This is especially so since the FY24 budget, in the FY24 budget, the manager expressed that, quote, the town is stretched to manage grants and thus applies based on staffing ability to implement and oversee them. Um, what must be done to address the climate emergency far exceeds what one staff person can do. We appreciate our current director, Stephanie Ciccarello's professional and dedicated work. She does the work of more than one person already. Um, I will let you read uh, our letter on the rest of that portion. I do want to mention that we would like to, we request uh, doubling the capital budget amount uh, from 200 to 400,000 in order to work on our, our CARP actions. And we also would like to um, to ask for any alloc unallocated funds or current budget reserves uh, that are in this budget to, to be used for CARP priorities. Um, on the budget guidance letter, um, that is just so important as far as starting out the budget process. We urge you um, to take into account that these aren't normal times that due to the climate emergency, priorities and fundings need to shift. 
in order to accomplish our very time sensitive climate action goals. Um, two things we'd like you to do. We'd want you to make sure you um, restate our strong uh, commitment to climate action and meeting our climate action goals. Uh, the type of language that we had prior to last year's budget guidance letter. Um, and also to remove the language suggesting that we shouldn't um, have new initiatives or fund them through the reserves or fund them at all um, because we have, we'll have a new council and we have the potential for looking at priorities in a different way. Um, and we would like you to take out the language uh, from last year's budget that seemed to deprioritize climate action by saying that the manager could, quote, forego taking on some new efforts until we have the funds needed for the major building projects, required work on roads and sidewalks, determine the long-term public safety plan and have the staff needed for the three public safety departments, unquote. That language was a major, major step back from our former commitment to climate action. So I really want you to look at that um, and uh, take a look at the specific requests we have in our letter that we sent this morning, um, including the request for staffing, staffing for the waste hauler proposal, um, and increasing the capital budget. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Darcy. So, uh, seeing no other um, public comment, uh, I appreciate everything that we've heard. It is all relevant to discussions we will be having in the next couple of meetings today and Friday. So, uh, it, uh, all public the public comment is very much appreciated. Uh, what I know that there's a number of people in the audience um, still from the lot who are uh, attached to the library project. And I just want to uh, reiterate what I said at the beginning that uh, we uh, do not intend to have a significant discussion today. Really, it's not going to be much of a discussion at all um, because what I was, um, I think that our major point right now is to. Uh, catalog questions that need to um, be uh, responded to. A lot of them were presented last night during the uh, council meeting. And uh, so what I decided um, is to uh, ask uh, Athena uh, to take that portion of the minutes that she'll develop for last night's meeting that have the questions and uh, work uh, and work with Lynn to make sure that that list is correct. Get it out to the members of the committee, um, ask members of the finance committee if they have additional questions, which they can send at any time to um, back to Athena. We can't have it be a public document because uh, of open meeting law requirements. Uh, so um, those uh, suggestions uh, will only go to uh, Athena and to me, and uh, then we'll have a more complete list for uh, the consideration when we meet on Friday. So that basically is the process that uh, we are undertaking and uh, uh, therefore, uh, we're going to postpone trying to address any of the issues we raised last night until we can get an organized group of uh, questions together. And uh, then uh, uh, those of us who are in this uh, role of trying to coordinate the meeting, make sure that we uh, get those out, get, get the questions out to the right people who can provide us um, uh, with answers and help us with our discussion. Uh, so I don't know, does anybody from the committee want to say anything more about what I just reported? 
and process. So seeing no requests, I think that what we want to do then is to go uh, on to uh, the guideline discussion, which is an item on the agenda uh, under item seven. And uh, what we're going to start with is since the guidelines flow from the um, financial indicators presentation last night. Um, see if there are any questions about the financial indicators presentation, and then try and uh, spend a few minutes talking about key issues. I have identified some to bring up. I'm sure others have also. So we would go forward from there. Um, so Paul, you have a question about this? Or? Just to, uh, I th uh, were you going to address the um, DPW um, request first, or are you going to wait till after you talked about financial guidelines? We were going to do the guidelines, then we're going to do the okay, fair enough. budget Thank you. So Thank that you. was the order. Uh, Matt? Thanks, Andy. I just, I wanted to, um, since we're going to tack on to the discussion from last night, I wanted to just sort of highlight my um, my key question for Paul, which I think would work into the guidelines eventually. Um, but I just, I mean, you know, taking away from, from last night's presentation on the indicators, you know, I just, I wanted to take a moment and commend you and, and other folks who have been um, involved in this process for a long time. Uh, you know, the debt service numbers that were presented in the indicators um, were, were extremely healthy compared to other towns in, in our region and puts us in a really good position for all the ambitious work that we're getting ready to start. Uh, our bond rating reflects that. Um, our reserve accounts reflect that. So I think, you know, there's been a lot of really careful fiscal management out of the town. And I want to give credit to Paul, Holly, Andy, you know, the entire team has really been um, extraordinary over many, many years. And so I just want to start with that. Um, you know, I wanted to just, of course, point out, you know, our, some of our tax rate issues and the impact on our taxpayers, um, you know, because as everybody points out, we have such a low property tax base, um, uh, you know, the, the impact and the, the pressure on um, on the property taxes is, is disproportionate, I think, to to the region, although not totally out of whack, but but is very significant. So I, I wanted to put that issue out there. Um, obviously, we always mention it in our guidelines discussions, but I, I do think it's it really is worth putting sort of front and center in the discussion is, you know, as we're doing all this work and, you know, as Paul mentioned, uh, the fiscal discipline that's required to do some of this ambitious work. Um, I, I do think that we should, you know, really maintain that as a um, as a central area of focus as we move forward in this. Um, and I did also want to sort of hear more. It doesn't have to be right this second, but as as we hear from Paul and Holly and the team, um, Paul, you did point out economic development as a major challenge. You know, in one of your in one of your slides last night in the um, indicators presentation. So that's something I'd like to sort of hear. Just I, I guess you know on the town side, town staff side. Um, what potential solutions you would you would point towards for that as well? Thanks. Uh, Anna. Um, so two questions here. Uh, first is Paul, are you planning to uh, convene the budget coordinating group, and if so, when? Uh, I, I thought that that was supposed to happen kind of right about now at the commence. It, in the charter, it says at the commencement of the budgeting process and. My understanding seems like the guidelines are the start of that process. And I remember last year we got into a bit of a pickle because we were, Kathy, I see you shaking your head and I know you want to correct me so bad, but let me finish, please. Um, so so I think that the one of the things that happened last year is when by the time we were, we pulled the budget coordinating group together, we were too far into the process. And so even if this isn't when it's supposed to or required to happen, I think that we should ask for the budget coordinating group to come together sooner rather than later. So we're not in the spot that we've been in in the past where it's it's too late and the guidelines have already been established and we're already further into the budgeting process. So that's that's my first part. Um, and and happy to hear all the corrections on why I'm wrong about that, but those are my that's my two cents. Um, and then the other part of the my thought was, and and this made me wildly popular with Paul last time. But I do think that we really need to reevaluate when we are hearing from town uh, department heads regarding the budget. And it's actually, it's kind of a smack in the middle of both the budget, uh, the financial guidelines, but also the town manager goals. By the time we hear from town staff, we have already established both the goals for the coming year and the financial guidelines. And while the financial guidelines don't always nece necessarily, and I looked back, 
from years before I was on council as well, um, the financial guidelines aren't necessarily getting into that nitty gritty of a budget because we shouldn't be in the financial guidelines. That's not the job. Um, and we are not directing town staff. But as we're developing financial guidelines and town manager goals, we're going off of old information heard directly from town staff, as well as what we hear from residents. And so I think that in order for us to do the best job in creating these the, the goals, which do directly inform the budget, as we see in the budget when amounts are crosswalked to, to goals, as well as with the, the um, financial guidelines, we need that information. I, I, I think that we put ourselves and, and town staff at a bit of a, um, you know, I don't think it's the highest and best use of our time to hear those specifics from them after we have a developed budget. Uh, it's a great opportunity to learn, but it doesn't actually shift anything for us in, in doing our jobs. So I want to put that out there one more time that I believe that in future, it's too late. I, I pitched this a while ago and it didn't go anywhere. So I'm pitching it again. I do recognize it's too late for this year, but I think that we shouldn't be hearing from them in, in May. We should be hearing from them in November and December. Um, my two cents. Thanks. Okay. Paul, do you want to um, respond to questions as they come along or do you want to, are you accumulating them? I'm writing them down so I can talk to them afterwards. Okay. Uh, Kathy. Um, a couple of things, Anna, and I do apologize for shaking my head. And it was just that. It's okay, it's okay. No, it, it's, it's been explained to me each year that the meeting we had last night is the budget coordinating committee meeting. And so it seems that the tradition has been when those indicators come out, we all meet together as the primary piece. Then it's the work of the council and the manager. And then we only meet again in that, a more select group if there's some mid-year, oh my gosh, kind of thing. So we got hit with it when the pandemic hit and we had to have an emergency meeting to literally change the guidelines. So I think what you're asking is, should there be a change in that tradition, which is we're not bringing the schools want a bigger part of the pie or the, the town services want a bigger part because it's 3% equal. So that's a different kind of discussion. So I just want, that was what I was saying is that we, we kind of just had that and now it's, we're supposed to be handing it off. So that was my, but we just had that last night um, reaction. But I do have a couple things about the guidelines. Um, I thought last night, uh, Holly, Jen, and all the people that worked on that, you flagged some big issues for us that we should quantify or talk about it in our guidelines as much as possible. The schools are losing ESSER um, and it would be nice to get from you, get from the schools. What does that mean? You know, like this most recent budget that they've been living with has this much money in it. What does FY25 look like the year we're about to do? So just, it's a loss of a hundred thousand, 400, I don't know, but just really give us a number to make that not be just conceptual. Then the other one you flagged is that we increased our EMT, our firefighter staff, and we financed the smooth in with that with the ARPA fund. And now they're coming fully on budget or they've been partially on budget. I'd like to uh, make sure we highlight that. So we had a general challenges section in our guidelines last year, but I think this is this year and um. I think Bob, a couple of us noted that when certain things happen, we had an FY25 problem or an FY26 problem, you know, that is ARPA money went away because we we brought in part of Crest with it or his school, then then suddenly we had this crunch. So so I would just like to get um I don't need them now, but uh, you know, the the impact on our budget of having to go whole and as much as possible, I know we find it, put pension and health benefits over in another box, but I think of one more EMT person is a person that comes with wages, salaries, and benefits. So I want the big, the bigger number rather than the smaller number that just shows one person this. So I, I think I think that's it. And then I just wanted to um, talk about grappling with something we are doing a lot on climate and on CARP in our budget. 
including in the capital budget, not just the thing called sustainability, but there's been a concerted effort to retool our buildings, um, to go to all electric, to retool our cars. So I'd like to be able to capture, and I can draft those sentences, you know, to say that's part of what we're doing. It, it's permeating that capital budget. And that's one of the reasons we need the capital budget. And my only other comment, and this is, I don't even know how to express this. It's, uh, I've mentioned it to Paul. There's money on the table for the town with, as we, even the North Amherst Library, where we moved off an oil base. HVAC system to all electric, we can get a direct credit back for that expenditure. So I just want to be, be sure that our understaffed finance department is supported by whether we have to do a consultant or something outside to help us grab every federal incentive dollar that's out there. So once we make the expenditure, the next year is when you claim claim the direct payment. So it's I want to write a sentence into guidelines to that effect, Paul, but it may not be staffing up to do it as much as a every community. Northampton needs this, too, to find the person that just helps us understand how we as a non-taxable entity file taxes to get money back from the federal government. And the list of all the things, there are a lot of things in it, more than you would think, that qualify for a potential direct credit. So it's an opportunity to enhance our revenue flow after we've made an expense to be thinking about. And those are my comments that are guideline related just on some of it is populating it with numbers. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Kathy. Lynn? Yeah, actually, I would like Anna to talk a little bit more about to both the uh, request for an additional BCG meeting and also um, hearing from staff and what she envisions that to look like. Um, that's all. Yeah. Um. All right. So I think to my first my first question, Kathy, I that makes sense um, that the meeting last night could be considered the BCG meeting. I think where I'm stuck is that I, I was looking at the BCG charge just to try to you know this the thought in my head that shouldn't they have have been meeting and I I I mean my like logistically have they met if we haven't called them to order and have they met when there's no current member representative appointed from the school committee and the two library positions expired in in June so they have to technically reappoint people to it so I think I struggle with that and then I I I have a question about one of the items on the BCG's charge is to develop financial guidelines and we get a presentation as that full group, but is that group in and of itself supposed to also be, according to their charge, supposed to be developing guidelines as well? And how does that happen? Um, and so I, I think I'd, I'd like clarity on that from uh, Paul or Andy on those elements of the BCG's charge and how that can be considered a group meeting if that group isn't you know, formally even called to order. Um, and I understand that every member is there, but I'm just a little confused on that. And if I could get some enlightenment, I'd appreciate it. Um, to the other point that I made about department heads, I think what I would be hoping to understand from it, and this was where Lynn, when I was when I was flushing it out, I was realizing that it's it's more beneficial to the goal setting process for the town manager than the budget guidelines. Um, I do think it still is beneficial for the budget guidelines, but I think that we set very specific goals for the town manager and um and we set broader budget guidelines. I'm, I'm trying to tread carefully to make sure I'm not jumping into GOL territory here, but I think about, um, you know, last year I was uh, the liaison to ECAC and I worked really closely and put a lot of time in with that group to bring their goals forward. Um, and and that included the, the uh, staff member for that committee working as in those committee meetings with them. And so I think that it's, it, what it raised for me was that we don't know what we don't know. And for us to develop guidelines and goals without the knowledge from staff on what the needs are and what the projects are that they're they're working with, um, we're kind of just grabbing whatever's loudest. And I don't think that that is the best way to govern. Um, and so I think, you know, 
the alternative the alternative here would be to hear from sort of maybe some some of the players that are um coming coming up more often when it comes to the budget guidelines so for example we talk in the budget guidelines a lot about roads and sidewalks maybe it would make sense to have um dpw come in for for that part to talk to us as we and not every single department i can understand that but generally generally speaking i think that if we're going to hear from one we should hear from all because i think it sets us up better I, i'm i don't have this like a written response prepared out for you but that's kind of where i'm going is that i, I think that for us to to be giving direction we need to know where we are and the financial indicators while it was an amazing overview from from holly and jen and athena I'm um i i think that we need more i think we need more detailed information if what we're supposed to be putting out is more detailed uh, as well does that help answer your question so it's the same thing that we get in june i'd like to hear where they are and where they're, they want to go um basically is the the overview yeah. thank you anna um i have some thoughts about what you just traced but i'm going to actually ask paul to go ahead and go first okay uh so first off the bcg did meet last year in December, right? You know, we typically have a December meeting and then they met again in, was it March last year? So the BC, BCG was the four towns meeting, or I mean, I'm sorry, different topic. <laughs> so the, the, the financial indicators is part one. BCG meets in December you, and you met and you were, I'm not sure if you were in the meeting at that time or not. And then there was, then they meet in March again. And those are the times when those four bodies get together and they talk about things. And, you know, I think, that, I know that those, they met those three times, um, or at least those two times uh, last year. And that's would probably be our same pattern for this year as well. Um, so we haven't called together, you know, we haven't gotten to setting us BCG meeting in December at this point. And because I think part of it is we've asked the school committee to figure out who's going to be their representatives and, you know, they newly constituted and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so I think, the, you know, BCG is meeting, it, it's fulfilling its function. Uh, BCG does not set the guidelines. It's more of a communication tool. I never see it as being a decision-making tool. It's really a communication tool amongst the three elected bodies by their representatives that have been chosen by themselves, by each body. So, um, so, um, and then in terms of the, um, the way it feels to me that you would, well, the way the council should do is you're looking at the big goals. I don't want you to, it's not your job to figure out, should this, should this, um, person get a copier or this person get a, you know, another part-time position. That's not your job. Your job is to say, we want to achieve these bigger goals. And, and then I come to you, my job as the executive is to come to you with a budget. And then, and I, and to support that budget, I bring the staff to say why they're doing their things. And you're, and I think that that's, that's the process that we follow typically. Um, so, and so I, so I think that that, bringing all the staff in and then you're going to have them all get ginned up about what they want and then they're going to come develop a lobbying technique because they all will because they know that they're going to get i want to get my thing into the, you're the ones who are in the policy making role and you're on top of everything it's really your job to say look out above the town and see where you where the town should be going and where you want to put our efforts and you've i think the council we've changed our government because of the goals that you set at the at the bigger picture like racial equity racial equity the crest department um you know sustainability those big things and so i think that's where the energy for this our chief elected official should be yeah thank you um yeah i'm going to make a couple of comments and then i'm going to recognize bernie whose hand is up um I think it is important that we make sure that as we do this, though, that there's connection to between the BCG and the Finance Committee. I don't think that they can run separate from each other. Uh, do you know, Lynn, who our members currently are on BCG? Do you... Our members currently are you, me, and Mandy Jo. Yeah, because I'm not sure that I recall the meetings that last year, but in any event, uh, that answers that question. The the other thing that I wanted to point out is that we have been very careful in the last two years of making sure 
that um, there's coordination between the budget guidelines that are approved by the council and uh, the town manager goals, which are approved by the council, that come out of separate committees. And uh, I, I'm confident that we will be able to do that again because we now have experience in making sure that that is, happens because inconsistency would really not be helpful to anybody and would probably drive Paul crazy. Um, and uh, so that, and the other thing that I, um, we just need to recognize too is that the putting together of the budget that is Paul's job then is a pretty complex undertaking. And uh, you know, it has taken town managers and I've been observing this process through two forms of government. You know, it takes the town manager several, um, you know, probably three months at least to put that, to, to do that and to do that well. And uh, therefore, uh, us getting guidelines um, is uh, by the end of the year and giving that space then for the beginning of the year for town manager to work with staff uh, is really important. And it might be more challenging even this year um, because there's a missing piece and that's a full-time finance director because our two um, acting finance directors have other jobs too. So uh, I would uh, be very hesitant to cut back on the time that is allotted between the issuance of council guide uh, guidelines and the town manager giving a budget back to the council uh, on the May 1st date that is uh, mandated. Uh, Bernie. Yeah, thank you, Andy. One of the things that um, I think people need to understand and appreciate is that in this, in, in some ways began before Paul uh, appeared on the scene, but he's managed to uh, push the process even further, is to have a process where you reduce competition uh, among various components for the budget pieces. I mean, everybody's gonna advocate for what they want, but building an understanding and you know, you look at the, the working assumptions in the document that it's 3% across the board. Um, you look at uh, uh, the budget coordinating group. Uh, you look at the meeting that we had uh, the other night to kick the, the process off. That kind of collaborative effort and information sharing, I think it's been really valuable and it's kept the town from engaging in some of the, uh, the, the nasty fights that I've, I've experienced and seen. In, in other communities. So I really don't think the council needs to uh, uh, get down in the weeds and hear from individual department heads. I don't think there needs to be any kind of liaison system, which is like my experience as an administrator is a kiss of death because people become uh, captured in advocates. So let's continue to uh, let's continue to share information. Let's continue to share <laughs> the wealth or share the problems. Uh, and this has had a, you know, it's, it's been remarkable. I just want to very quickly recall a conversation I had not too long ago with a couple of firefighters. And I said to them, you know, I'm on the finance committee. We have an interest in getting you guys a, a new firehouse and, you know, a new, new headquarters and all this. And they said, yeah, well, we appreciate that. But, you know, the highway guys have it worse. They need to come first. That is an unusual <laughs> um, and, and very important kind of attitude that I think has been uh, fostered and in, in, in brought along in terms of the, the budget discussions. And I'd like to really um, congratulate Paul and, and the team on, on that and hope it continues. Thank you, Lynn. You're muted though. Um, one of the things that I find both challenging and interesting about on a suggesting some more interaction with department heads but it's it's something that i've had to just come to trust because and that is that 
our department heads and many, many, if not all of our staff are extremely professional and they bring uh, enormous thought to the trends and issues that we should be dealing with. And in many ways, I can think of times, frankly, where maybe counselors began something, but frankly, staff should have been consulting and taking either a co-leadership in that issue or been leading that issue. So I so I think one of the things that the town manager is, whether it's Paul or anybody else, is always going to be challenged with is the fine line between making sure the great staff ideas are also coupled with great policy ideas at the counselor, in this case, counselor level. And, and yet to do that in a way that doesn't walk across the line where Paul or whomever is the town manager. He is managing the place. And, you know, Bernie, you know, you and I both have seen situations where departments aren't getting along and, you know, and they're vying for somebody's attention and it it becomes pretty crass. But I really want to respect the fact that, and I'm sure I, I don't want to put words in, on his mouth, but I want to respect the fact that our staff really are extraordinarily people, extraordinary people with really good ideas about where we should be going and how we should be getting there. And we have to trust that the town manager is hearing that and incorporating that as we go forward. So I, I, that's just my interpretation of what I want from staff and what I want to come through the town manager uh, from staff. I don't know on if I've hit it or not, but it's in that category. Yeah, I, I mean, I and I don't, it's this fine line. I'm so sorry, Andy, can I raise my hand? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, I'm oh, sorry. Um, it's this fine line, right? Because I am not, there's no part of this as that is intended as an overstepping of the council. And I recognize that it's really easy to jump into that place. And that's not what I'm trying to do. I think I'm trying to, what I'm trying to reconcile is how big picture those, those, um, the financial indicators are with how um, micro we can get in our goals. And Paul, what it seems like I'm hearing from you is that you don't want us to get as micro as we've been getting in those goals. And yet at the same time, broad goals mean that it's, it's you know, it's it's very easy to meet broad goals with it and miss the intention of those goals. Uh, and, and again, I'm not uh, insinuating mm -hmm. that you would ever intentionally mm -hmm. do that, but uh, when you list concrete things in goals, you're able to say whether they've been met or not. And so I think that that's, these are the lines that we're trying to tread with this. Um, and so I guess I'm trying to think about alternate ways of getting at that. Um, and I think if if possible, and again, I'm looking to future years, this isn't gonna happen for this year. And, and Andy, I also wanted to clarify, in no way am I trying to say that we should shorten the amount of time that Paul has to build the budget. I'm talking about moving back in time, right? Um, I, I, I don't know how he does it in the time he, we already give him. I'm not trying to make that shorter. Um, but I think that maybe if there were a way to get more of an update, not from department heads themselves, but from Paul that gives a little bit more detail into that, um, into those those operating funds or whatever, however it is that can help us a little bit more to shape the guidelines based on what we see as, as those internal needs. Um, maybe that would be a way to sort of get at it without doing the entire process. I think we, we get information that's way up here and our goals will need to be somewhere in the middle. I, I, I get you that they don't need to be nitty gritty, but they also, the goals can't be so big picture either. So I want something from the town in some way, whether it's Paul or whether Paul directs town staff, that's a little bit more middle, that's a little bit more detailed about the needs and the um, and the successes of the areas within that sphere. I hope that clarifies it a bit. does a little bit. I think that the uh, problem that I would have with it is that uh, 
the general statement we make every year in the guidelines is that the community values the services that the town is presently delivering and we uh, want those services to continue we don't get into the nitty-gritty detail of saying that we want more of this um, because that gets into the question of does that mean you have to have less of something else and what do you have less of uh, that at some point uh, unless there's a very specific uh, guideline presentation that is, comes out of this committee or comes out of the council I think that it, our tendency is to kind of leave that judgment to uh, Paul and that, that it's appropriate for the town manager to have that goal so that if uh, uh, to produce one department and add to another because of a reason that it doesn't come at the council level because we aren't critiquing the services and evaluating the services to that level of detail. And uh, so I'm not sure how to go forward with what you're suggesting to balance it to uh, Bernie. Uh, I'd just like to uh, uh, acknowledge that I, I, I understand and I know where Anna is coming from. And, you know, as a slack when I experienced that, it's not the moment of being a town council. Certainly experience that that kind of like I really want to know this in detail. I also have great admiration for Anna's ability to handle detail in complicated situations, mm -hmm. and I very much appreciate that. Um, so it's not um, uh, you know we're, it, it might be a different story if every counselor uh, were possessed of those skills, but they aren't. Uh, I, I do think, like I said before, I think the idea of having the town uh, the town manager being the central point, the central focus of this process uh, is key to making it work. Because I know what I experienced as an elected official when I would get stopped by a town employee who would tell me that you better vote for this because we wrote the budget. Um, you know, it, 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 it does add some distance, it adds some perspective. And uh, uh, I think uh, I agree completely with, with Lynn, we have a highly professional staff um, remarkably so, uh, in, in, again, in my experience. And, and let's, um, the counselors, I would hope, would be conscious of if they, when they're setting goals, what the fiscal impact of those goals might be. And there might be uh, more additional dialogue with Paul around, um, you know, what's it going to take if we want to do this. Uh, but uh, let's keep the system as it is and uh, uh, because it's been working. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so are there any specific questions about information that was presented yesterday? We've been going on a sort of policy level about any of the financial indicators uh, and, or how they were presented or anything, because otherwise we should then move on to some guidelines questions and uh, and see if we can uh, get onto the orders um, because I think we'll have given as much guidance as we can to the first stage. Matt? Thanks, Andy. Uh, yeah, I have a process question. I was just looking at the um, work plan and somewhat ambitiously, uh, there is a hope that we can finalize budget guidelines by December 1st. And then I know we'll talk about the schedule later, but I just I just wanted to know, are you, are, are we, you going to circulate last year? I mean, just if you talk about sort of how we're going to attack the document as a group, I think that'd be helpful to me. Thanks. Yeah, I, I will do one of two things after today's uh, meeting. And that is uh, they just go ahead and get out last year's guidelines again for everybody to look at as a reminder, which I probably sh you should do anyway, uh, just to make it easier, uh, but also to at least see if there's some beginnings so that I can start making adjustments uh, for the next year and I have some questions that I'm going to present in a minute so that we and then uh, see if there are any comments on them and then go on um, and uh, but it, it is a massive process to do in a small number of meetings is such a advance to uh, Lynn did you have anything 
Yeah, I I just want to make sure that um, it's one day one a couple issues that were brought up last night. One was the compensation study and the extent to which we need to be aware of that as it relates to the financial guidelines. A second uh, issue that got brought up um, was um, whether or not we actually do want to entertain increasing the percentage that we put aside for capital. Uh, right now, I believe we're at 10 and a half percent. And then we also later, but it, this is not necessarily part of guidelines, but it, it may be. And that is that there are a couple of those markers that we look at that would be useful to look at in relationship to other uh, municipalities that have heavy higher ed populations. And uh, in looking at that, it's because of my own personal desire, and I know that of other counselors, to really try to pursue the issue of pilots, both from pro public and private higher ed institutions. So those are issues that came up last night um, that um, I don't know how much of that belongs in the guidelines and how much of it just is something someplace else. Thank you. Yeah, I might come back to that in a second. If not, I'll talk to you about it later. Uh, Kathy? Yeah, I have a suggestion because that's one of the reasons, um, Matt, when you looked at where we are in the in the great in the month of November <laughs> and that next Thanksgiving is next week. Um, how are we going to get this done? So my suggestion, Andy, is if you could send us the Word version of last year's guidelines, and then to the extent any of us have the wherewithal on whenever you think we're going to actually start working on it, um, we could put suggested changes, areas to change, and we could mark it up. Um, and then we might get more quickly to a final document um, and you know so some are all and we would just send them into you or we could um, it's one thing we we've done in JCPC where there is a draft and people send in and then I just pull them all in and we get pretty quickly to a final so if we could get the word document rather than the pdf that's a request the second I asked for a little bit more information on the loss of ESSER and bringing EMT in um, if um, if staff could quantify for us what a 12% increase in health insurance costs means um, in terms of the top line of it, not how it hits every single department. Because I'm, I'm thinking of that, Lynn, counterposed to your, can we go any higher than 10 and a half? Because it was really... Um, when Sean per first put in 10 and a half, it's just because I, I tend to remember numbers. The year when nothing worked, we're hitting 2025, 20, 26, and 27, that we couldn't be higher on 10 and a half and still be funding operating budget. You know, like we, we had we had a little bit of breathing room um, because of ARPA and ESSER. And, but now we're in a, the salaries, the contracts were settled. You know, so there's a pay increase somewhere built into all of this. So I just like a little bit more so we can both for the whole council, but for the town, have people have a good picture of the tough spot we're in. We're not in a bad spot. We're just in a tough spot in terms of where do you put. And so, you know, when I because I'm JCPC, I mean, one of the things you did and I don't want to do this in guidelines, Paul, but. We had a couple tough years on capital, and we just said we're not buying any vehicles this year. You know, live with whatever vehicle, and that made some room for roads. Or you know, it was within that we we made room for something that we valued more highly. And so, sort of trusting Paul if his limit is ten and a half, you know, to come to us. So I just so it's my request is the twelve percent healthcare. Give me an what that means for next, year, next year's expenses. How much of the total expense increase is in just that alone? And Lynn asked about compensation. And then I wanted to quantify loss of ESSER. So we can bring those in in a what we're facing when we say 
which if any of these things can we touch, let alone do we want to touch, but can we without this delicate budget falling apart? You know, and we already have, Paul, the Jones is coming in too, because the line that's in for uh, repaying the debt and the uh, insurance, we have a good solid line running through the capital, but that assumed a much lower interest rate. So at some point we're going to have to you know, when does that hit? It may not hit FY25 that much. So I'm not going to worry about it in FY25. And I'll stop there because I'm I'm ready to mark up. I looked at the guidelines. I'm ready to do some marking up because a lot of it's fine. We just have to plug in the more recent numbers, but some things need um, a strong rewrite to convey a message. Yeah, I'll look for that, uh, the final word version as we always convert it at the end. Um, Paul, do you have anything? And then I wanted to move to the guideline questions and get on to the next agenda item. Great, thank you. So um, just quick answers um, on the on the health insurance. We build that into, if you remember last night, Holly showed a very quick spreadsheet, but we didn't get into the details. That's the spreadsheet that this committee will look at. That's built into that number. And you can, you know, we can change that. It's a spreadsheet. Obviously, you can change it. And then that's how we determine if we have enough funds to go to 3%, 2 percent whatever. So we put in all the what we believe are our fixed costs in terms of revenue and expenses first. And then as those numbers refine, we can change those. And then it shows where we have some leeway. So that's in built into it. Uh, loss of ESSER, um, the, we had a fiscal stability committee that we had met once or twice uh, that included the finance directors from both the school and the town. Both are not in their jobs right now. Um, we have subsequently, uh, in, uh, we're getting a proposal from a uh, someone who does has done this for other school districts because every school district is looking at the migration off of ESSER funds and what does that look like and how do you digest that? So we're getting a proposal from somebody who can come in. We don't have anybody who can coordinate that for us right now. Um, and it's a big job and someone who has to know school finances mostly. So I've talked with, I've been working with the superintendent on this. Uh, we've all, all the finance folks have met this person. Um, and so we're looking at bringing them in to help coordinate that in a, just in a targeted it's um insight full way for the it's really for the school department more than anything but it impacts us um so just those two quick things andy okay nice holly did you have something um yeah i just can very quickly and it's not always that way but i was able to really quickly calculate what a 12 percent increase um estimate would be and that's about three hundred and seventy thousand dollars that's just for the general fund. This affects region, this affects Pelham, this affects the libraries, this affects all four of the enterprise funds, but for the general fund budget only, it would be about $370,000 at a 12% increase. <coughs> okay. You, but does, now you were saying the general fund budget includes the other schools and library Do I understand? Are you no talking? no it, it, it will also affect so, so just our number and an increase of three percent the libraries go up three percent the region goes up three percent functions okay just Thank general you. fund so the questions that I had identified I don't think we can discuss them today because we need to get on to the uh, financial orders. Uh, but uh, one is the question of whether we're comfortable with revenue projections. Um, I think the answer is yes, but I just want everybody to have an opportunity to uh, think that through and come to the same conclusion that you're comfortable with what was presented last night on revenue projections. Uh, I think we need to... Um, uh, just recognize that we've had some long-standing policies and uh, that I'm assuming them again, unless um, somebody's going to say otherwise. One is that um, we don't spend reserves for operations uh, because once you set up an operating need for reserves, uh, then what are you going to do the next year? 
use more reserves. Um, it does. It's not a sustainable funding source if you do it that way, which is why we tend to do capital out of reserves, but not um, operating. So that's that's another question. A uh, uh, question that I'm going to assume, unless people say otherwise, that we still stand by that general principle. No override request uh, to our voters is um, a third uh, it is an additional um, item that we need to be very clear about. I think that the question has already been raised about are we staying with 10, 10 and a half percent for capital? Uh, we worked our way very slowly. I mean, very slowly from 7 percent to 10 and a half percent. It was quite an achievement to finally get 10 and a half percent because uh, we know the need is great, but we also know that the operations side of the budget is very demanding. Uh, so, but I did I also identify that as a question. Uh, we have had a longstanding principle of um, having equal increases for municipal school and library. And that has, uh, in the former form of government, uh, was very successful in keeping battles from taking place on the floor of town meeting or limiting those battles to the extent that they were. Uh, and uh, I think the same question, thing has been of value for the council, because if you start allowing um, variations in every year, um, it's going to put a lot more pressure on the council process and uh, and on Paul and whether that's something that we would want to do. But so I'm assuming that, uh, again, that that's uh, still our principle. Uh, we've had the discussion of ESSER, uh, but ESSER is really a school function. I think when we get to the municipal side, which we tend to function to to pay more attention to in the guidelines because we don't develop the school and library budgets that's uh, developed elsewhere and presented back to us through the town manager. Um, but is, is there any other ARPA or one-time funding that um, is uh, running out that we need to be thinking about um, as to whether there are things that are currently being funded with grant funding that uh, we need to be aware that they're going to disappear and uh, the, that we would want to um, talk about and see if it's important to continue. And um, then the last one I think has already been talked about uh, fairly greatly into what Anna was uh, bringing up, which was whether there are any municipal programs that uh, require special attention. So those are the um, issues that I identified uh, as needing to present for uh, all, everyone to think about, but I don't think we have time to really dig into them and address them. I'm gonna assume, uh, for example, in the end, that the answer is no. But if somebody um, comes up and says, hey, wait a minute, what about this? Then we need to talk about it. Uh, so with that said, uh, I'm ready to move on to the next item, but I want to give anybody else a chance to say if they're not ready to move on. OK, so we want to go to the supplemental budget appropriation requests, and we'll count on Paul to take leadership on answering initial questions. Um, and because uh, I think that the answer on each one, are we, care are we comfortable recommending to the council the adoption of the order that is recommended? So we want to take the orders. And I think that we um, had agreed that we would start with um, DPW um, orders because Guilford is here and uh, then he can go if we just uh, do those first. So um, 
I don't know if you want to put them on the screen, if you have them available in. If not, uh, I think you knew the order we were going to take them in. So if you can enlarge it in any way, that would be helpful. Let me see what I can do. Uh, but in the meantime, I don't know, if Paul or Guilford, if you want to at least uh, start with the presentation and uh, give an overview of it and then see if there are questions from the committee. I'll just start quickly. So just a note that this is coming from retained earnings of the sewer enterprise fund. It's not coming from free cash. It's because sewer, the sewer is an enterprise fund. That's where the funds are coming from, from the retained earnings. So Guilford, do you want to talk about why the appropriation request is there? Uh, yes. So we've been having a, a slew of items re breaking on us lately. Um, the plant, the plant's old, and some of the equipment in it is is old as well. So what we've had is we've had several valves that have failed. We've had a couple of motors that have failed and pumps that have failed, and then we also had the collapse on Snell Street, which we weren't expecting that section of sewer to collapse. Um, that was, it cost us about $110,000 to actually have that repaired. Um, so we've been spending our appropriations for the, uh, um, the sewer enterprise system pretty rapidly this year. We've actually been doing it for a couple of years now, but we, we were able to cover those. Um, so we were just asking for an extra $500,000 in capital to cover pumps, the gates, valves, and some sewer line repairs that we know we need to kind of get to and stuff we've already actually repaired. So that's where we are and what, what's going on right now. And I believe the, the balance in the un, uh, undesignated retained earnings balance is, and Holly can confirm this, $2.6 million is in there now. So, uh, for the committee, questions? Kathy? Um, I think, well, Paul just answered, Paul, that's before the 500,000. So this Correct. would pull down to, so um, so I guess my question, Guilford, is if you can be looking forward rather than uh, as each street or pipe collapses, do you have a sense, because um, we, we're not at the point of what our next year's sewer fee is going to be. I hesitate to even talk about this, but I, I was in your office and saw a, pi a pipe you had there, which was a pretty amazing one that had all these holes in it. And you said it was one of the newer ones and it's you didn't know what had happened. So do we, maybe it was a water pipe, but is are we going to hold, is that 2.1 that's remaining with a, you say you've got a slew of these, or are we going to uh, need to do something that's on an emergent level? The, the goal is not to do something on an emergent level. Um, we've been saying for the past few years that we've been hoping to get our wastewater permit in hand so we know what the permit was going to require us to do. Um, we have our draft permit in hand. There are no major changes to the plant that we have to do. So that means we'll probably well, it means we will start doing a, a plan to actually start replacing things that need to be replaced. So you will see in the next year or two, you're going to see a, a plan that's going to be um, relatively ex, it's going to be an expensive plan, maybe a million, two million dollars to go through and replace things that need to be replaced um, because we don't have to upgrade. Um, our permit said we didn't have to do that, which is great. Um, like we have the GBT, we're adding the second GBT at this time. That's an upgrade um, and replacement of an existing system. The older one will be your backup, but then you one will be the primary. Um, so we'll start that process now that we have our permit and you should expect that yes, there'll be some capital expenditures that will increase in the sewer fund as we move forward in the next few years. But all you have to work with is 2.1 million right now. We'll work it in. We'll work it into the capital plan and the and the rate. And we actually, if you look at um, how the funds went this year, we actually brought in about um, six hundred. I think it was six hundred thousand more than we th planned on bringing in. So we did make more money this year than we originally thought we would. So that you have to calculate that into. I can't, and Andy, I yeah, can't. Go ahead. Please. 
So this is transferring money from the sewer fund to the capital. This is not using the um, free cash, right? It's being it's using retained. The proposal is to use retained earnings, which is the term that is used for accounting purposes for um, the uh, enterprise fund equivalent of cat uh, of uh, free okay. cash. Okay. So Got essentially, it. using the free cash bucket that is specifically uh, from the sewer fund as an isolated enterprise and uh, transferring it from what is essentially their free cash, but called retained earnings to the budget so that it can be spent. Um, and so it's really same thought process but a separate bucket thank you but i given all of that i just wanted to make sure i was seeing that the right way um my uh, my question builds to some extent on kathy's but brings in another issue and that is the issue of as we do roads are we using that as the opportunity to upgrade the infrastructure systems under those roads? Like we, like we, in this case, we had to partner with the state to do Route 9, but it seems to me that that's the optimal time to do upgrades where we suspect we may see problems coming up because of just aging infrastructure. As we do major road upgrades, we, yes, we will do those utilities underneath us at the same time. As we shift more into a maintenance mode on roads where we do just an overlay or a shim coat or in, a crack ceiling, those don't get the utilities looked at as quickly or as intensely unless there's a real problem there that we know of. So major upgrades, we do utilities and everything. And then the maintenance that we're going to try to do more of is they don't get as much look at the utilities. Okay, yeah. I so I I just want to make sure that we're 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 using the opportunity to build up the funds now for that down the road. I think and that historically so the town has done that, and uh, I give the example of Pine Street uh, because all of us remember everybody having uh, <laughs> bumper stickers that said "I right. survived Pine Street," right. and. Uh, the reason that it was delayed uh, and uh, was, was simply that uh, Guilford and the enterprise funds had to uh, take care of major needs that were lying under Pine Street and so it all went together. Okay, thank you. I'm fine and I'm ready to make a motion if you're ready. Yeah, I was gonna do that too. Uh, and so I'm just gonna, uh, make a motion uh i move that the finance committee recommend that the council approve council order 2405 c in order appropriating funds for the town of amherst sewer fund capital campaign change seconds okay there's been motion that's been made and seconded and uh, unless there's uh further um uh, discussion requested and I don't see any hands then I'm going to go ahead and just go alphabetically by last name um Anna Devlin Gauthier aye uh Lillian Griesmer aye Bob Hegner support Matt Holloway support Bernie Kubiak. Support. Uh, Gaffy Shane. Yes. I'm a yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Okay, so this uh, has been recommended five to zero with the um, three members who are resident members in support. So um, the next one uh, I believe uh, that we were going to take up is 2405B. Is yeah. the um, other capital uh, one that is related to Guilford's department? This is the right one, right? Yeah. 
So um, I don't know if people want to have it increased in size, but um, yes, Lynn. This is the beginning of a bigger conversation, one I know you've been expecting. Uh, of course, I'd like to make this bigger, but frankly, I don't think we can at this point. But how would you suggest that we approach the development of a multi-year funded uh, program that would attract maybe partners in other other towns, but would attract <laughs> the people to come in to repair our roads? And how are we going to get on top of our road situation versus what I think we saw this year is we're just getting further behind. So I'm well, gonna call on Paul and Guilford. Well, we just had this conversation, Guilford. <laughs> so, so actually we're, we're doing much from the person driving on the road, they probably don't see that much difference on their small side roads. But the person driving on the main roads, we're in a much better shape than we were a while ago. Um, the issue we've had in the past was we only relied on Chapter 90, and we didn't add any additional money to it. The best thing to do, and the most important thing to do, is every year you, we need to decide ahead of time, this is how much money we're putting in the pot. We're not just going to do Chapter 90, which is $890,000. We're going to do more. And if we know that money in advance, we can put together a road project to bid. That's that am amount of money. Um, the money and deciding on that amount of money is the most important thing that can be done up front. Because if we know, then we can put together the road project. Um, we're doing about three to four million dollars a year right now on road projects. That doesn't that includes what you're authorizing in Chapter 90, and it also includes what comes out of these grants, like the Mass Works grant. The uh, um, we have another Mass Works grant that will do some paving for us. Th those grants we push them all together, and we get a base. We get what we're all going to do. Um, but the most important thing is no is we're going to put $3 million, which actually is probably a good number. Um, it doesn't get you what $3 million used to get you, but $3 million is a good number for us to have. If you want to add more to it as the year goes on, that's great. But just as we knew we had like that amount of money every year is coming to us, then we could schedule out the roads a little better and make things work better. Um, can we see that in a separated planned document that's multi-year and begins to lay out for us what we need to have in our financial guidelines this year and every year in order to do that. So I guess in some ways, instead of suggesting, oh, maybe we should go above 10.5, we should in fact say, a certain percentage or a certain dollar amount every year should be in the budget on a multi-year basis. I mean, I'm I'm looking for a way for us to have much more assurance that we're getting ahead. And I know I know we give the people in Amherst enormous, tremendous service, but I can't tell you the number of people that have said to me, and I'm a taxpayer and I can't even get my road fixed in front of my house. Yeah, okay. Um, I agree with what, what Lynn just said. And, you know, if you think of what it means practically, if he gives us a multi-year plan, does that mean every year out of the 10.5 capital draw, we're putting it, we're going to do at least a million in roads and we don't, roads have often been the residual, like if we don't do something else. Right. So, so I think trying to look at Paul also how, how we might, pre-commit. I mean, this way of committing now is if we have a surplus, we we pull a million out if we can. So that's some of our surplus may not be so surplusy going forward. I mean, that's not a for sure. So my my other my related question, and I I think people will argue with me that this is not true, but I think a lot of the wear and tear on our roads is because we have a major university here with a lot more cars than we might otherwise have, and a lot more delivery vans and trucks. 
um, that would, if we were, I mean, it, so we're not, you know, like Amherst was never the sleepy little town since I moved here, but I know what rolls by my house. Uh, I'm on 63. So uh, a hard car push for our state legislators to say either a big bump up on chapter 90 or an allocation, and they could do it in some even way of any town that has a major public university in it with a lot of people driving on the roads gets a bump up on their chapter 90. You know, so Lynn, trying to think of how you would frame it, that it's not us just asking for a, um, our own handout, because I think the the chapter 90 has been flat, Guilford, am I right? I mean, I'm not just in real dollar terms, in actual dollar dollar terms, um, if I, it's the same number every year. Yes. <laughs> and so it's, 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 it's not just failing to keep up, it's not keeping up in any other way. It's, it's a shrinking share of our road budget. So I just think a really big push. And you mentioned once, and I'll stop because I see three hands up. You mentioned once that you wish there weren't so many little pockets they would just put it all in one big bucket at the state level because we spent we spend a lot of time saying, oh, I could get a piece out of here or I could get a piece out of there. It's a staff intensive time. And then you've got these. If we could articulate that more than what I just did, Anna, you know, I'm piecing together things from all of this. It's a message um, our legislators might be able to work on. Um, and this happened in healthcare years ago that you could piece together the funding of a community center if you were willing to apply to a hundred different sources, <laughs> but no one source would give you the money you needed to survive. So maybe we could articulate that, you know, we get something if it's near a school or we get something if it's near this, but it would be nice to have just a pot. So I'm thinking state-wise, but Lynn then at a more local level, is if we're saying we're going to intend to spend this much of JCPC dollars, um, that says, well, what else are we not going to spend it on? But it's, are we willing to do that? So I don't know if the answer is yes, but are we willing to do that? That's the question. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, from being on the MMA Fiscal Policy Committee, uh, part you know the underlying problem is exactly what you're talking about. There was a formula that was used for the development of the Chapter 90 allocation. The uh, formula worked to the disadvantage of Western Massachusetts communities and to the advantage of Eastern Massachusetts Boston area communities, which is no grand surprise. Uh, and uh, it was therefore finally an effort in the legislature to put some additional funds into, a, as you noted, another special pot having to do with um, the miles of roads in the community because the uh, formula didn't really put significant enough effort uh, priority to that particular aspect. Uh, and just a couple things to note. One is, is that that money hasn't been allocated out to communities yet and probably won't be until uh, February or March from what we've been able to determine at the Fiscal Policy Committee when we ask that question. And the other uh, uh, thing that uh, is just obvious whenever you get into these discussions is that uh, if you change a formula to uh, be more balanced towards your needs, you're going to be working against somebody else's um, and it's a political game and we all know that. Uh, so this is uh, never an easy issue. Uh, you know, I try and work out um, the discussions for our in our favor in the uh, fiscal policy committee. Uh, but even if I'm successful there, uh, then you get into the next uh, level. And I can give you some examples, but I'm not gonna go that, into that now. Um, Ernie. Yeah, um, all those, those little programs and pockets and um, forces I think forces Guilford and his staff to be opportunistic 
Um, and so it makes it very difficult for them to kind of proceed in a, uh, in a priority needs fashion uh, because uh, something might, you know, bright and shiny might come up and we can capitalize on that, but it leads to questions like, why are you doing that and not this? We do have a pavement management plan. And I think uh, uh, Guilford and his staff can, can make use of that to give, um, you know, the, to give everybody a, 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 an idea of, of what a good base would be to, uh, you know, to follow that plan and make the needed uh, repairs and changes to the roads that are suggested by the pavement management plan. So we've got that, um, we've got that data uh, and we, we need to make better use of it in terms of projecting funding. Uh, and finally, uh, I, if you're going to ask for some kind of add-on, um, I would use the term state facility okay. rather than university sure. or college, because that broadens the pool. And the broader the pool you have, the more likely you are to get some legislation passed. I would think the folks in Bridgewater would be more than happy not only to have some recompense for Bridgewater uh, State University, but also for um, the prison there. <laughs> uh, you, you, you know, you, I, I think that uh, um, uh, that would be a, a better tactic to take is to say, you know, you, you establish these large scale developments, Commonwealth, that have an impact on us because it takes, uh, it takes our wealth away. It reduces the taxable property we have for one, and for two, it imposes costs and uh, that go over and above what you're, you're paying us. So that would be my suggestion is you, you broaden the pool and you look at state facilities. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and to but, uh, emphasize that in the fiscal policy committee, when we talked about pilot on state owned land, I was careful not to just use the term university, but to talk about how state owned land is utilized um, what is uh, um, and what is the effect on the community and the costs that the community incurs because of the state on land. And then I quickly turn to Charlemont every time because Charlemont has brought up the fact that uh, they have so many people coming in to use their state owned land for recreational purposes that they have tremendous uh, public safety and public works requirements. And uh, uh, I use Charlemont to help me uh, not focus on the university as a sole piece. Um, so thank you, Bernie, for bringing that up. Uh, Matt? Thanks, Andy. Yeah, three quick um, things. I do I like this conversation very much and I, I would support uh, any efforts we can make towards it. Um, so last year when I brought up the, uh, I and several others mentioned the idea of regionalizing and working with some of our neighbors, um, the answer was that this might go against the philosophy of New England town governance, which I was a little bit taken aback by that, that notion. It made me think that, um, so, so if that's not something we can explore, I, I think we need to, as, as Lynn prefaced this, we need to be looking at, you know, multi-year comprehensive planning. Um, and I do think that, you know, some regional collaboration may be necessary uh, regardless. The other piece is the um, the FERCOG collective bidding um, program. I realize that that may not be something that folks want to uh, engage with either for various reasons. I'm sure there's there's plenty of downsides to it, but I think a public discussion about that would be helpful um, for folks who are not like aware that FERCOG, it's, you do not have to be a Franklin County town to join that, um, but it's a sort of a, a fee for service process that allows for as I understand it, more efficient bidding. And there are several Hampshire County towns who are in that as well. So I think that'd be a good thing to have a public discussion about. Um, and then finally, I've, I've, I've actually suggested all three of these things before, but I just want to put them on the on the record again. Um, I come back to sort of, you know, Lynn and Anna and the council leadership. I do think that, that TSO or a different ad hoc subcommittee of the council would be a useful body to sort of drive this work forward internally and, and to see a multi-year plan um, that gets results. And Gilbert, I, I want to actually uh, just double up on what you said. I, I have seen a lot of paving work <laughs> happening in town, and I do think that we've made really good progress on some of our larger um, through fairs and, and you know, the rotaries as well. So 
you know, I think the town may have to make some hard decisions on, on some of these smaller roads that are in disrepair, like, you know, mine being one of the one of the examples. I mean, you know, we, it is it is a, a tough challenge to try to pave as many roads as we have. And I and I think we're putting the priorities in the right places. Um, but but we I think we do need um, multi-year planning on this. Thanks. Anything else, Lynn, or because otherwise I'm going to um, make a motion. And the motion is that uh, I move that the Finance Committee recommend that Council approve Council Order FY2405B in order appropriating funds for a portion of the Town of Amherst Capital Program Road and Sidewalk Repairs. Second, Greetsmer. Yeah. Many people second that one. So there's been a motion that's been made and seconded. Uh, Paul? Oh, not for this item, for next item. Okay. Uh, then let's uh, go uh, take a vote and we'll move down one to first start and start this time with uh, Lynn. Aye. Bob? I support. Matt? Support. Uh, Bernie? Support. Uh, Kathy? Yes. I'm a yes. Alicia? Yes. And Anna? Aye. Okay, so um, that one is approved. Uh, Paul, did you have something you wanted to add now? Before yes, please. Um, I just want to know if you think the Finance Committee is going to get to rental registration today or not. I know I have our Building commissioner in the audience. Uh, fine if you are, but if you're not, just we'd like to let him go. Um, why don't we do this uh, so that we can let him go? I sent an email, um, which raised the, my questions. Um, I had two questions that I asked uh, of Rob and uh, that would help me. And if other people have questions uh, that they would like to pose to Rob or uh, to CRC, if we could just get them uh, sent in, they don't have to go through the committee. They can just go um, through Athena or through me and uh, just do it that way, and um, then Rob probably would not need to stay longer. Uh, Kathy, would you have? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that, Andy. I just, I did actually uh, take the spreadsheet and work on it a bit, and I also just read the legal memo, Paul, on, you know, I'm again looking at places where frequency of inspections matters. So can I also, I can put together a memo with some potential change ideas and I could send it to Rob and Mandy so they could just have them if I don't have to go through the whole committee, if that's okay with people. I mean, it, I have a, I am trying to get to the same totals, but in a different way. Um, uh, so, and so if you'd rather I don't do that, I can wait till we do just come back to fees. I just, I, I don't want them to do anything for me. I just want them to see the ideas. Um, so. I, I guess, Andy, I raised it just to know if you're going to meet beyond 3 p.m. or not. Because, um, and so if, if you are, I, I'm sure Rob would be happy to get, have this conversation. But if you're not, I just I'm don't know. I'm thinking that if we can get through the rest of the orders, that's probably going to take another half hour, and then we really need to adjourn. Okay. People have gone over already. Um, okay. So it's okay if you don't mind if Kathy just sends that um, to Rob right. Mandy. Sure. Okay. So thank you, Rob. Sorry that we got delayed on this, but let's try and get through the rest of these uh, supplemental orders. So, uh, the next ones are fairly straightforward, and uh, they were presented last night by Holly, and uh, she um, explained the uh, policies of 
uh, trying to make sure that we have 10%, that, that our free cash is at 5% uh, of the general fund uh, budget that uh, and the, uh, the uh, stabilization fund, the general stabilization fund is a 10% that above that uh, we transfer to uh, two other funds. And uh, so we know what, what they are. And um, one of them being reparations and the other being capital. So I'm, I'm ready to make a motion if you want. Well, um, I think we, we traditionally go through each one separately. So I'm going to, uh, let's just keep going with uh, what we've been doing. I'm going to move Andy, on. Andy? Yes. I have a question. Um, may, I, may I speak? Yes. Yeah. So um, we were adding 767450 to the general stabilization fund. I thought we already had 10% in the general stabilization fund from last year. Did, did, is this just the due to the increase in the, the budget? I mean, the, 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 the overall town budget, or did we somehow tap into some something in the general stabilization fund that we have to replace? Paul, do you want to answer that? Or do you want to ask Holly to answer? I, I think that's Holly's question. Holly? Um, I'm, I'm double checking right now I don't believe that we used any general stabilization last year we used capital stabilization mm -hmm. um it is likely due to the change in the in the in the budget figures that, that's fine I, I just want to make sure that we're not we weren't somehow tapping into that fund and that was something I didn't think we needed to do so it's a to, to in... vote of town yeah. council to take money out of there. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. um, no, I think it was just that the changes in the um, we had also the year before, unfortunately, uh, before interest rates got really great again, we had had some market losses. So there, the year before the balance did go down this last year, it did go up. And the only difference would be um, the change because we did not use money. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, we could uh, we could we could talk about the investment policy, but I think that that's going to delay us a lot unless somebody really has questions about it. Uh, but the uh, funds generally, uh, our policy is to invest with the um, state uh, department of uh, our treasurer's uh, fund, but and they. They manage the investments for municipalities. Uh, so I make a motion that the finance, finance committee recommend that the council approve council order 24 FY 24 12A in order appropriating from free cash to the stabilization funds. Second, but I'd like to speak to the motion. Yes. Um, I'd like the record to capture that for the reparation stabilization fund that at some future time, a committee who is given the responsibility of disbursement from the reparation stabilization fund could come to the council and request money out of that fund in advance of it meeting its two million dollar limit, a uh, two million dollar goal. Because I'm trying to capture what I believe was the essence of the recommendation in the HRA re report. You want to do that now, or is this the AHRA policy discussion that we need to have in order to finish out the AHRA recommendations on section three? I, I guess I'm feeling um, 
the need for both finance and GOL to do something that recognizes that discussion. And I don't care if it's with this or in a carryover memo, but somehow or another, we not put aside the fact that there has been a request and a discussion about the possibility of a successor assigned committee using coming to the council with a program that they want to spend funds for in advance of there being a million dollars. Two million. Two million. Two million. Right. We can uh, make sure uh, that Athena puts that in the minutes of this meeting. And I think that we need to carry on the discussion uh, with the AHRA. I made reference to the fact that I had spoken with Michelle earlier in the day and that she was fine with uh, our passing uh, the, our, our, the this recommendation for the transfer being made through what we're doing now. And I pointed out exactly <clears throat> the issue that you um, just raised and said that the, uh, we need to have that discussion. And uh, so she's well aware of it, but uh, it's, it's really, I had conceived of it as being when we get back to actually making a report back to the uh, council regarding the section three, which is what our assignment is. That's fine. Matt? Yeah, Andy, I just wanted to echo Lynn's desire to do something on that, especially with the 20th. So I just checked the report being due on the 20th. Um, so, but I, I think I'm hoping we have that, that list of questions is in the packet, but it hasn't been touched since sort of the partial answers we got previously. When, when will we see answers to the rest of the, and I particularly want to see the modeling question for, you know, for uh, the expenditure. I actually think that this may be what's referred to as a carryover item that we're going to, in the end, okay. uh, recommend issues that can't be resolved before the end of this council term and have to carry over to the next council. And uh, I have not had a chance to talk with the chair of GOL directly about this, but it's my understanding that the part that was assigned to them for consideration is also going to have to carry over to the next council. And so that uh, the, uh, I think that they both do. And uh, uh, what Michelle said when I was talking with her um, is that uh, she understands that she just would like to see the carryover memos being very specific that uh, we recognize the issues that need to be addressed and uh, that uh, we're committed to uh, providing responses to the issues that were assigned initially to the current committees. So I think that uh, the discussion will happen, but it's probably not gonna happen that quickly. I don't know, Lynn has said, uh, I think you talked with her also today. And yes. I think we're all, I think I, we're all I, in the same place. All we're, I think we are. I think we all realize we're not gonna resolve this during this term. And that's all I'm, I mean, I have nothing else to say. Yeah, Kathy. Uh, yeah, I just want to ask, um, I agree with what Lynn's suggested on records showing, and I liked your wording a lot, Lynn. Um, so I'm wondering, in, Andy, you said it could be in the minutes, when we report back our recommendation for these different um, transfers, could we also put those two sentences in to say we didn't forget um, in and, and so it would be in a council document. It wouldn't just be in the minutes of the finance. So I didn't know what you were asking for, Lynn, because the minutes, it gets kind of buried. If it's yeah. in a council document, it stays with it. And I'm just saying that, you know, in doing this, we also noted, and then uh, the, the wording that Lynn provided, I, I would be comfortable with that. So I don't know whether others would be. Yeah, 
I like it in the report that we do. I'd also like it to see mentioned in our carryover memos. That's yep. all. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Lynn, if you have the sentences down or can record them, otherwise I'll ask Athena. Uh, I think we're going to have to ask Athena. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have a motion that has been made and seconded, I believe, regarding uh, Council yes. 3412A. And um, we who seconded it? I, well, I'll second it if we don't have a record or someone Let's second. Make sure we seconded it. Okay. I second it. Yeah. Okay. 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 I, th I think Lynn did. I think I actually seconded yeah. it. Yeah. Andy made Andy made a motion. Lynn seconded it. Okay. Um, so. Um, Moving down the alphabet, one more to start uh, to take the vote. Bob Hegner, Bob. Uh, support, support. Matt. Support. Bernie. Support. Kathy. Yes. Tommy, yes. Alicia. Yes. Anna. Aye. And Lynn. Aye. I think everyone has voted and it's uh, five to zero through support, um, which then gets us to Council Order 2404B. And uh, maybe what I'll do is, since we heard the presentation of this last night, uh, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion and then uh, if people have questions or discussion, we can let it come after the motion has been made. So I move that the Finance Committee recommend that the Council approve Council Order 2404B, an order appropriating a supplemental increase to the Town of Amherst operating budget for fiscal year 2024 to incorporate four firefighter positions previously funded by ARPA. Second. And the second was Anna. Anna. Okay. Um, so um, are there any, does everybody understand what the source of these funds are? Because this is actually a transfer from uh, the ambulance fund it is not a transfer from the uh, free cash so i just want to make sure or if, are there any other questions or comments people wish to make if, if i may andy yes J just so i wanted to bring highlight that we are including the benefits costs for these four positions so we want to highlight that um and we called that out explicitly. Just I think that was a question Kathy had raised earlier. Um, so we are trying to capture the full cost of these uh, additional positions. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Uh, uh, hopefully that will get into the minutes. Uh... I, I just have a quick question, Paul. Is the UMass money going into the ambulance fund and then this is coming out of it? Yeah, yes, Holly can address that if you want. Holly. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, so the ambulance receipts uh, reserve for appropriation account, uh, the strategic partnership gets split up and sent to a couple of places, but this portion of it is to fund the additional firefighters. It goes into the ambulance fund and then we will annually um, add that to the amount that we um, take out to cover portion of their operating budget. Yep. So we will see this appropriation every year. Every year it will be it will be part of the original budget from this point forward. Oh, we okay. transfer an amount into the ambulance fund um, at the beginning of each fiscal year to cover a portion. Mm -hmm. I believe it was about two point eight million dollars last year to cover their capital and a portion of their operating budget. Um, we're doing this now midterm, but next year it will just be part of that original number. Okay, thank you. I think we can move ahead then. So um, 
so there's no other hands up, and I don't see any. I'm going to call start the vote moving down again alphabetically. So that makes Matt Holloway the first person I'm going to call on. Support. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Support. Yes, Shane. Yes. Nami, yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Evelyn does. Anna Devlin Gossier. Last name works too. Aye. <laughs> yeah, well, you answered lots of questions, things, that, but we won't go into that. Um, Lynn Griesman. Aye. And uh, Bob Hegner. Support. Okay, so again, it's unanimous with uh, all three resident members in support. And it passes, which then brings us to Council Order 2416A um, regarding free cash transfers to the Cannabis Impact Revenue Fund. And uh, is there any question that people have after last night's presentation of what, how the cannabis impact money gets into free cash? or what this is about. Kathy? Um, I don't have a question about this. My question is, and and I apologize if this was already said last night, I'd like to know what the balance in this fund is. And I have the same question for the opioid and what we can use it for. And do we have any plans to use it? So it's a three part. Uh, my understanding is we have to do this. It has to be sequestered the way we're doing it. So I'm a yes for both of these orders, but I'm, um, what what kind of balance are we building up in each? And then- mm -hmm. We know your question, yeah. Holly, you know the balances? Yeah, so the uh, the cannabis impact fee one had been, um, had been accumulating for a few years and we did a transfer last year. It was 713,451. Dollars. So this brings the balance in the cannabis impact fee to seven hundred and sixty-three thousand five hundred. The opioid money FY twenty-three was the first year we got it, so the hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars will be the balance. Um, there are other ways to account for this, but this is the most easiest way to account for it, and then we can appropriate it um, without further um, action from a special revenue fund. Um, they both can only be spent on, um, and, and I can I will find the um, information. I found the one on the op opioid money. Um, I I wasn't able to find yesterday the one on the cannabis impact fee, but they can only be spent on mitigating the um, you know the effects of substance use disorder. So it can be used for educational programs. It can be used, um, you know, in the schools. It can be used to buy, uh, like the opioid money can be used to buy um, Narcan and, uh, you know, counseling services and and things that uh, folks um, um, who have substance abuse disorders, you know, are, are looking for. This is to mitigate the effects of both the um, the cannabis, the impact of having those sales in our town, and then the opioid settlement funds. And I will find the information and, and send it along to you folks. Yeah, so the impact, and, so just, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, yep, next question was, I, I missed the part about, um, do we have plans for it yet? We do not have, um, concrete plans for it yet. There are a lot of ideas. I know that the schools are looking to um, maybe tap into some of this money for some educational programs at the school level. We just hired our new public health director who is already asking lots of questions about this. And I, I believe I'm meeting with her later on this week to try to figure out how she can go about starting to get a plan together for this. So, Thank you, Paul. Yeah, two, two different funds, two different purposes, but the cannabis impact has to be t tied to the cannabis, to the impact of the cannabis establishments. And so it's kind of, you know, we, we're we looking at what other communities have done for it to it. Um, it's a lot of money in there, but a lot of it, and there's some limitation of how we can use it. The opioid is brand new. Our, our new health director, as, as Holly says, really all over this and eager to work with Craig Stores and other groups about how to allocate the funds um, for their purpose. But, you know, I think the first step is to set them aside so we can account for it, so we can report on it when we need to. 
I think that when the cannabis uh Matt's got his hand up too. Passed, uh, it was a uh you know the the thought behind it at the legislative level was costs like unknown public health education and public safety costs and uh is a general matter it has probably turned out to be more difficult than I think the legislature had anticipated at the time to identify costs that fit into those kinds of impacts. I'm not going to be surprised if the uh, Cannabis Control Commission doesn't amend uh, the requirement uh, or eliminate the requirement, but the funds are there and they have the definite purpose. Matt? I just want to um, say I'm excited to hear that, you know, you're having these conversations when when this came to us last year. And I think this is smart to have a special account, obviously. But when this came to us last year, we we talked at length. And I don't remember exactly what the final decision was, but we we talked about like a reporting mechanism that wasn't too cumbersome for Paul and staff. But I think we collectively are just curious because as I have read some of those, you know, some of the restrictions on the use of the funds is, is you know, it's it's calls for creativity, hard work, but it's it's a significant chunk of money. So I, I'm still, I, and I don't remember exactly what we agreed on, but I think we found a solution that was not going to be cumbersome in terms of reporting, but it allowed us to at least, you know, be informed of it. And I hope we are going to honor that whatever, we can all honor whatever we agreed to. I think that last year, the uh, uses went through the school. Uh, the uh, Former Superintendent Morris had a couple of very specific proposals, and uh, we did fund those. So, with that, I'm going to make a motion um, that the finance. I move that the finance committee recommend that the council approve Council Order 2416A, an order appropriating from free cash to the Cannabis Impact Special Revenue Fund. Second, Greesmer. Okay, so the motion um, has been seconded by Lynn. And um, if I uh, believe that at this point, if there's no further discussion, I don't see any hands up. We'll start with uh, Bernie. Support. Kathy. Yes. I'm a yes. Um, Alicia? Yes. Anna? Aye. Uh, Lynn? Aye. Bob? Support. And Matt? Support. So again, we have unanimous vote with all three members uh, who are resident members in support. And the last one is that um, I move that the Finance Committee recommend that the Council approve Council Order FY24 16 be an order appropriating from free cash to the Opioid Settlement Special Revenue Fund. Second, Griefer. Okay, I'll show Lynn again as the seconder. Um, any further discussion? We did talk about this a little bit. Um, and I think that at this point, uh, we're on to Kathy starting. Yes. I'm a yes. Alicia? Yes. Anna? Aye. Lynn? Aye. Bob? Support. Matt? Support. And Bernie? Support. Okay, so again, five to zero with three resident members in support. So uh, we have uh, taken care of that issue, talked about rental registration and preparations. Uh, so I think that we've talked about all issues on the agenda. I have uh, nothing, nothing to report other than what's already obvious about next meetings. Um, I don't think we have any scheduling questions because we've scheduled them, scheduled already. 
Uh, I don't have anything that was, I did not anticipate 48 hours in advance. Is there anything else? Lynn? Yeah, I'm wondering if we're going to have to look at meeting twice right after Thanksgiving. And I think that's a good question. I think we should talk about that next uh, on Friday. And it, you know, and if we can do that, do it the same time we're doing today, Tuesday at two, uh, Tuesday at one. Why don't we leave it at this since everybody's present? Uh, uh, can I just ask? Is that November twenty eighth? Yes, it is. Um, the design team on the school is here at Fort River and well, I probably can't be there for the whole meet the beginning of the meeting. Like it starts at 11 in the morning, but they're going to be here. I might be late. So I could definitely start at two um, on Tuesday. I just, it's, it's unusual for me to have a conflict. Let's, let's make it two. I'm just, I just am being realistic at this point. Is that agreeable to the rest of the committee to start at two o'clock and that Tuesday if a meeting is needed and let's plan that it will. Be. Can I just make a request? Um, these middle of the day meetings, they're really, really hard. I'm I'm working way over hours to make them happen. Um, if we can do as much sending questions to Andy in advance, getting answers in advance and just focus on getting to our votes that we need to get to. I, I know everybody knows this. No one wants to be stuck in meetings, but Whenever we add those two hours, it's it it makes life a lot harder for um I know everybody, but I'm just gonna reiterate that it makes right. I'll speak for myself only. It's making it really, really tough for the for the next couple of weeks. Um when I've got a that that pesky job thing. So um I know I'm not alone in that, but if if we could really try to pull it together and and get as much in advance to Andy um and get answers in advance, that would be very, very helpful. Yeah. Are we not meeting at all next week? Yeah, if you go back and uh, pull up the... No, we are not. You could. That's why I asked about the 28th, Lynn, because we could. <laughs> we could meet on the 21st. No, <laughs> don't. Paul, oh, I'm sorry, That's I didn't know you were joking. <laughs> Let, uh, let, let people have a Thanksgiving week. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> yeah. I with me. Boy, I totally agree. Okay. We're holding the 28th, but you know, on a, for instance, I could meet that evening if that would be more helpful to you. Uh, but I don't know if others can. I don't need to play calendars. I just, I, I think that, I think some of the things that come up, we, at, at some point, we need to be satisfied with the answers we get. Um, I, I think that we will always have more questions. And so I think, I'm, this is more of a, 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 not really a morale boost, but sort of an encouragement to folks to, if we could get to a point where we're ready to start voting on, on things and, and really keeping it within the time, I'm just stressing that this is this is really getting getting tough. Yeah, got it. It is. Uh, I think we all are feeling it. There are two times of the year this happens it's for this committee uh, in May and um, during the end of the year. And, the election year. Okay. Yeah, the election always makes it a little bit more difficult. Uh, but it, let's all pay attention to Anna's request and uh, try and do what we can to do things in advance. So I have nothing further and don't see anybody else making requests. So therefore, I declare that the uh, meeting is adjourned at 325. Great. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Yep. Thanks to our staff. Thank you. Thank you.